one that's here today and glad to know that um, we're on the winning side. Amen. When you're on the Lord's side, you're on the winning side. If you need a book, if you'll raise your hand, I'm sure Brother Jeff or Brother uh, Ben will bring you a book. We've got two regular size and a, many more of the big ones. Anybody need a Sunday school book? Little? Big? Let me just give you. Raise your hand and Brother Brother, brother will bring you all some Sunday school books. All right. Everybody else? Sister Jessica, you got you got a book, don't you, honey? Uh, I love it. Can I borrow one? You can borrow one, yeah. How about Sister Betty? Y'all got a book? Good job. All right. Just want to make sure everybody that wants a book's got a book. Amen. Amen. Well, I pulled over to the side of the road this morning because I was going to be too early to get Sister Jones, and I was talking to my sister. And I'm just talking away, and then I get this call coming in. I said, "Oh, let me let you go. Somebody's calling." But one of the good saints saw me on the side of the road and thought I was having car trouble. So thank you. Thank you, Brother Michael, for thinking about, amen, uh, this poor old soul. But I wasn't broke down. I just kind of pulled over. I didn't want to get to Sister Jones's too soon. And I, I said, I'll be there at 9.30. And I tried to live. A, and I always say, Lord willing. You know, we do what we do, Lord willing. We can say we're going to do something. But sometimes our plans fall through. You know, sometimes the car won't crank. Sometimes we can't get started, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we don't crank either, you know. But I'm just, I'm just happy to be in the house of the Lord today, and I just hope everybody is that's not here is at least listening, uh, amen, by way of however they're listening to us today. And uh, we're starting a brand new series of lessons on uh, the purpose and plan of God. And, uh, you know... Uh, we often try to make plans for certain things in our lives, as, as I just mentioned a while ago, you know. Lord willing, Sister Jones, I'm going to be there at 9.30, Lord willing. And we will, we, we, you know, we, we do a lot of planning sometimes, and, uh, and we make plans for different things. But uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to look today on how God has a purpose and a plan for our life. But before we get started, I want Brother Chris to stand and pray. And while he's praying, I want you to pray with him. Sister Kay called this morning, and Brother Jim is very sick, and she said he needs a touch of the Lord. So let's all, Brother Chris is going to take us to the Lord in prayer, but let's all pray and ask God to touch our Brother Jim. Amen. And pray for Sister Kay, too. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead, Brother. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just know that you're the mighty God. We know, Lord, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Lord, we're praying today, God, for a touch of the Master's hand upon our brother Jim, God, that you need your healing touch today. Lord, send your word into that home, God, and bring healing, Lord. God, touch your people today. Sister Kay needs your touch, too. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. You may be seated, those of you that are standing. Thank you, Brother Chris, for praying over our lesson and praying for Brother Jim. And uh, they had planned on coming. Even she said they had laid out clothes ready to come. And he's just not able to be here today. He needs the Lord to touch his body. So you just be prayerful uh, for Brother Jim and Sister Kay uh, today as you're thinking of them and that the Lord will just touch their body. These old bodies get wore out, don't they? My Lord, my Lord. But thank the Lord we're here today and able to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, a purpose and a plan, we, we're, that's what our whole series is going to be about, uh, the purpose and plan of God. So uh, planning, sometimes we get busy with planning, and um, <clears throat> I'm not a good planner, okay? Some people, I mean, they, if you're a procrastinator, you can't be a planner. <laughs> so now you know where I fit. I'm, I'm one of those that procrastinates. But we, we have four daughters, and one of our daughters, she is a, she is an excellent planner. She, boy, I mean, she just puts it all down in, in perspective and, you know, down to the, the T's, they're crossed, and the I's are dots. But her mother kind of works off the, you know, at the spur, spur of the moment. And I've got a couple of girls kind of like me and a couple of them like the daddy that, you know, they, they're real planners. And, uh, you know... Never mind about all that. Uh, <laughs> not that. Uh, but um, some people plan out vacations. We we don't we don't we don't go that way either. 
but they choose a destination and then they go to all the lengths of making reservations, travel plans, and how much money they're going to spend and the length of time that they're going to be at all these places. That they're planners, you know. But you know, uh, our lesson talked about this being planners, and uh, as we we make plans, it, it went on to say that we came by this uh, by way of our God because God never haphazardly does anything, and we're made in His image, and and so our inclination to plan comes from God Himself. I guess I am planning because I planned on picking you up, Sister Jones, and I did it, so I I planned on that. I made that that observation, so maybe I'm not so much a a procrastinator, but but anyway, we're made in His image, and and uh, yes, I am too. Okay, thank you, Pastor, for that encouragement. Uh, uh, so from the beginning of creation, folks, the Lord had a plan called Calvary. Uh, before man ever failed in the garden, uh, the Lord, you know, He wasn't caught by surprise by what happened there uh, in the garden. He He had a plan. And, and, you know, our plans, as I said a while ago, sometimes they can fall through and, and, and not happen as we had expected them to, but not God. His plan, folks, will never fail. Uh, for instance, uh, our lesson gave a, 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 for instance, the people of Jericho, you know, they thought they had planned and they had built walls that were thick enough and they were protected from the enemy, but they were no match for the plan of God. Because when God said to the Israelites, you march seven, seven days, uh, and on the seventh day, you march seven times, and on that seventh time, you shout. Right. You blow the trumpets, and, and the walls are going to fall down flat. And you know what? God's plan worked. And as a matter of fact, God's plan always works. And in these final days that we find ourselves in, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But God's plan, folks, for his church will not be prevented. And uh, in the end, it's the purpose and plan of God that's going to stand the test of time. That's why we need to be anchored in Jesus. Amen. Uh, so today we're looking at the lives of four young men, Hebrew men, that had been taken captive by their Babylonian uh, enemy. They were, uh, they were, it didn't take long for them to be met with a challenge, but sometimes after I, I get through with my lesson, I get to thinking about it a whole lot. And I, I got to thinking, you know, probably the king of Babylon, when he came down to Judah to take God's people, um, and, and all that transpired, I kind of got a feeling that those Hebrew boys had already been working on a plan. What's going to happen when we get down to Babylon? Right. They already had a plan in action. I want to think that. I don't know that. I just want to think that. Uh, but uh, they were, these, these Hebrew boys were soon met with a challenge, whether to obey God's word or partake of the food that, that their captors had provided for them. Uh, and so... Uh, God's people had been given a, a diet plan for the, uh, from the law of God that would help keep them healthy. And uh, Daniel must have stood out when he stood up for his faith. Daniel and his three Hebrew boys, Hebrew friends, trusted that God would take care of them. And, and the men who served uh, these Hebrew boys, they were afraid for their life because if they did what the Hebrew boys wanted to do to them to do, then they may not come out looking like the other ones that ate the king's food. Uh -huh. So uh, at the end of the trial period, though, these Hebrew boys, uh, they looked better than those uh, Babylonians or whomever was eating the, at the king's table. They looked fairer and more fleshly than those because of God's favor upon their life. And folks, uh, I, I'm going to say it again. If God be for us, who can be against Amen. us? Right. When we make a stand for God, he's going to stand for us. So Amen. our test of faith may not depend on what we have for dinner, but our faith is tested to show we're called to be separate from this That's world. It. That's right. you know, we, we may not be challenged in that way, but, but we're going to be challenged. Our faith will be challenged. You know, we give the first tenth of our income to show that we trust God. We talk differently to glorify God, and we dress differently to honor God, and we live holy because we serve a holy God. That's These right. are things that we do as a child of God. And so when the enemy tempts you uh, to sit down and just fit in with the crowd, do what Daniel did and stand up and stand out. And you right. know what? You're going to find that God will stand for you when you stand for him. Right. My, our grandson who's in high school this year, 
I picked him up the other day from school, and he said, Mama, he said, he said, we had people in the class that didn't stand today. I said, stand? He said, yes, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I said, well, did you stand? He said, yes, ma'am, I did. And he said, I'm looking around at these people wondering, why are you not standing? I said, well, honey, don't you ever quit standing. Amen. I said, you know what's right, you keep standing. You know, we've been taught, we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. You know, I, all day, I don't know, I, I guess I've just been thinking about standing up and for the, what's right. And I, yesterday I was singing, God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairie to the ocean wide with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. Probably most of our children don't even know that song today. But we grew up, that was the first thing we did. We, we pledged allegiance, we read the Bible, and, and we sang uh, songs about God bless America. I'm just feeling patriotic today. We need that in America today. We need God in America. We've had all this other junk long enough. We need God back in our in our in our in our homes, in our cities. That's what's wrong with our cities. God's not in our homes anymore as a whole. We trying to fix the country when we gotta fix our own home. Oh yeah, I'm getting sassy with this, but it's the truth. We don't teach our children to love God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And thou shalt have no other gods before you. I'm telling you, it's time we begin at home, in our homes, to teach a love for God, a love for our country, a love for authority. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling too, too whatever there. I need to, I need to calm down, you know. Oh, Bring it back in. Oh, no. But I'm just talking about standing up for what's right. Oh, for what Amen. Right. So, uh, how we think has so much to do with our spiritual journey, folks. It's one thing to know truth and embrace it, but it's another thing to be fully persuaded and convinced of truth, so that we make right decisions. You, when you know what's right, do what's right. Amen. Don't let people persuade you because the crowd is going that way. I'm telling you, I grew up in school, in public school, and I was in the minority. I was the little girl, you know, that, you know, well, anyway, I, 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 didn't, I didn't follow the crowd, so to speak. But I'm going to tell you, God kept his hand upon me, and God blessed me. And, and I, I didn't have to walk for friends, you know. When you live for God, God's going to honor you. Amen. That's right. He will. Uh, so... So though we live for the Lord, we, we will still struggle. We'll still struggle with worries. There'll be anxieties, uh, insecurities. These are things that we struggle with just because we're human, just because, you know, we, we are human. And, 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 and we wonder why, why we would even doubt. But maybe because for a Christian, the mind, it's got to work in agreement with the heart. And, you know, our mind directs our actions, and our redeemed heart is what conditions and guides the mind in the right decision. You know, folks, a redeemed heart will cause us to separate ourselves unto the Lord and be holy. When this old heart is right, I said, when this old heart is right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take care of everything else. Right. Right. If our heart's right. Right. If our heart's not right, then we got problems. Right. Right. You know, um, uh, as a child of God, we are to learn to be sensitive to the leading of God's Holy Spirit. Right. And sometimes that, that's a, a training process we have to go through. Uh, I can remember as, as a, a younger uh, child of God, you know, adult, younger adult child of God, I can remember, uh, you know, my, as my walk with the Lord, I can remember I would feel a prompting of God's spirit to just tell me not to say what I want to say, you know. In my mind, I, my mind is telling me to say this and thus, but in my heart, being God's spirit talking to my heart, I'm feeling like, that wouldn't be the thing to do. And when you obey the Spirit of the Lord, then the Spirit, the more you obey, the more the Spirit talks to you. Right. The more you disobey, the less you get talked to. Right. You're right. It's, it's, it works that way. But but as 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 God's Spirit leads us and, and we learn to trust the Spirit's leadership instead of uh, allowing the natural uh, human mind to to lead in uh, our decision making. You know, this old this, if if we let a carnal mind and a carnal attitude right. direct us, we're going to wind up in trouble. Right. 
But if we allow the spirit of the Lord to order our steps, right. trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy path. So when we give our trust and, and our confidence to God, then he'll lead us in the right paths. And, and we, we won't be all the time uh, opening our mouth and putting our foot in it. I've done that before. How about you? Yeah. But, but this comes about when our minds have been transformed by God's Holy Spirit. I love Romans 12 and 2. I actually, I love 1 to 12, 12 and 1 also where it talks about, you know, um, I beseech you therefore, brother. But verse 2 is what we want to look at. It says, and be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't be like the world. That's right. It went on to say, but be you transformed. And that transformation is, is to be changed for the purpose of proving what's right in the sight of God. Uh, a transformation, how does that happen? It comes by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, and you know, and this is done when our mind is refreshed or made new by the working of the Spirit of God in us. Folks, God's Spirit is a Holy Spirit, Amen. and it does what's right. right. And when we allow God's Holy Spirit to order our steps and our, and our actions and our way of, of thinking, uh, then, then we're going to do what's right. We're, we're, we're not going to have to be apologizing for our actions and our attitudes, but we're going to have a right spirit about us. We're going to manifest the, the fruit of the Spirit. So in other words, uh, it's telling us don't be like the world, but be changed for the purpose of proving, proving what's right in the sight of God. You know, in our relationship with the Lord... <clears throat> Our heart and mind must work together. Uh, you know, Daniel had a heart that sought to please God. That It was in Daniel's heart. And, and Daniel's made-up heart. If you notice, the title of our lesson is A Made-up Heart. That, that made-up heart is what informed and empowered uh, his human mind to follow after and to, to maintain the convictions of his heart. Because I'm just going to tell you, the Scripture teaches us to, to guard our heart, for out of it are the issues of life. Our, our heart has got to be, got to be protected. It, it's the enemy's business to sow things into our heart that's not right. He wants us to get our feelings hurt. We talked about that last Sunday. He wants us to, he wants us to get discouraged. That the enemy does. He wants us to feel like, you know, nobody really cares about me. Well, it's me attitude. And when that happens, it gets inside of us. And when our heart gets gets to feeling these things, then our mind will begin to work. And when that old mind begins to work, it'll lead us in the wrong direction. But but our relationship with God, we gotta have that heart clean and pure. No wonder Jesus said, Blessed are the pure. Pure in heart, for they shall see God. This old heart's got to stay right before God. And we keep it right by staying in a right relationship with the Lord, by talking to him daily. Can I just say this? A good marriage relationship is one where the husband and wife talk to each other, not scream and holler and fuss at each other. I'm just saying. You don't have to listen, but I'm saying it anyway. You know, you know when, when we speak kind words, you know, uh, just gentle words, you know, just a, 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 a soft answer, the Bible said, turneth away wrath. You know, when somebody hollers at you and you holler back at them, it's not long till there's a hollering match going on. But if you just hold back and let the Spirit of the Lord just lead you and you just don't return that yell for a yell or that uh, attitude bad attitude for a bad attitude and let God's spirit just lead you and guide you he'll 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 soften that other person and they'll that won't be long they'll be saying I sure I'm sorry for hollering at you a while ago right you just go on be at that meek and, and and gentle spirit okay uh, I need to get off that don't I? I'm getting too I'm just getting too nosy right now um so so Daniel he, he had that made up heart that, that empowered his mind uh, to follow those convictions that he had. Folks, if we ever need to follow uh, God's leading, we need it in this day and hour. Oh, my Lord, my Lord. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he besieged Jerusalem. Let's read. I'm starting in Daniel 1 and 1. Our lesson started in verse 3, but I, I, I like to pick it up right at the beginning. Uh, the Bible said, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. 
So we find in that third year that, that the king of Judah had, had reigned, King uh, Jeho uh, boy, these names are really, really, really good long ones, Jehoiakim, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he, he overtook the city of Jerusalem, and he, his army overran the city and took part of the treasures from the house of God and carried them to Babylon to the temple of his God. Now, that, to me, that's a sad story, to take what's been dedicated to the house of God and put it in a pagan God's temple. Uh, such a sad part of this story is that it was the Lord that gave Judah over into the hands of, of the king there uh, of Babylon. There, and there, here's what happened. Their captivity came because they refused to turn back to God and listen to the prophet of God as he began to tell them to repent. And so judgment came. And we, that, that kind of is where we came up to at the end of our series of lessons uh, uh, in our last three quarters. And so uh, verse 2 says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Those beautiful vessels that had once been dedicated to Jehovah God now were being taken to an idolatrous temple of a pagan god in Babylon. And there's a lot about these pagan gods that we probably can't even wrap our mind around because we didn't live in that day and time. But a lot of their idol worship was so, so, so bad. Right. It was just it right. was horribly evil, evil things that went on. Uh, and so this is the beginning of the great exile of Judah uh, as the prophet had prophesied was going to happen. And the people, uh, they had strayed away from the one true God and now they were reaping the harvest of their sins. And folks, as I was reading and, and studying this lesson, I thought, dear God, here in America as a whole, we have strayed far, far away from God. I'm, I, I can't, I, I'm telling the truth. It, it, it hurts to tell it, but it's the truth. As a nation, as a whole, our nation was built up on the foundation of in God we trust. And now people don't want you to talk about God. They don't want you to talk about the Ten Commandments and the Word of God. They, they want you to just do whatever you want to do, what's right in your eyes. Well, you know what? When folks start doing what's right in their eyes, they're going to bring the judgment of God upon them. And not only did Nebuchadnezzar take away the sacred vessels of the house of the Lord, but he also took uh, some of the brightest and most intelligent young men of, of, the, of the land of Judah. And among those, we're, we're fixing to read the names. Verse 3 says, And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, well-favored and skillful, how? In all wisdom right. and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and when they, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So this was, after the victory, the Babylonians usually took the most talented and useful people back uh, captive to Babylon. And among them were four young men Let's read their names, and yep. the, uh, let's see. I'll read them in just a moment. Uh, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, and I'm trying to get it right. Instead of Michael, it's Michelle, okay? I knew if I said Michael, I could say Michelle. That's what I was pausing for there. And Azariah. But we know them with their Babylonian names as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's right. Now, these Hebrew names that they have, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, we don't, we don't use those words. You can tell by me having a difficult time pronouncing them. But I can say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. But those were their Babylonian names that were given to them. So each of these young Hebrew men had names... Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, those names were names that honored the God of Israel, the one right. true God. That's right. But one of the first things that you'll notice after they arrived here in Babylon, uh, the prince of the eunuch gave them uh, a different name. And they, but here's the thing. They may have changed their name, 
but they didn't change their nature. That's it. They still were committed to the one true God. Amen. That's right. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's difficult when we are approached with, with and challenged with things uh, and to, to, to take and make the best of it. And that's what these guys did. They took a bad situation and they made the best of it. Amen. That's right. I'm talking to us right now. Yeah, you are. We're going through hard times right now, we think. Of course, I think it's going to get more difficult as the sooner the Lord's coming gets near and near. But, but in these times, we need to turn it around, the challenge that we're in, and turn it to something good for God. Amen. That's right. We, we ought to be seeking ways that we can do that. And so uh, these young men, they, they, they may have been, Daniel was, um, verse 7 says, and to whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Mel Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to uh, Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. So uh, this name change was part of the Babylonians trying to condition them. Our lesson, or one of the, the commentaries that I read while I was studying this, said that that was their way of brainwashing them yeah. by changing their name. Uh, so uh, they may have changed their name to try to get that Hebrew teaching out of them, but they had a made-up heart. That's it. That heart was fixed on God. And so Daniel meant God, the, the name Daniel means God is my judge. Uh, and he was given a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, which means the treasure of Baal, which was the God of that day. But uh, it did not change. They may have called him Belteshazzar, but in his heart, he's still Daniel. And he still believed the, the one true God. Amen. Amen. So uh, the king commanded these boys that, that uh, you, you're going to be taught our language. You're going to learn the literature of the Babylonians. And, and, and along with all these things we're going to give you, we're also going to give you a daily portion <laughs> Of, of, of food and wine from the king's table for the next three years. Now, the king might have thought that was a good thing. He might have thought, wow, you know, here they are, these strangers. I'm feeding them good. I'm, they're eating the very same thing that I eat. Right. And they're drinking the same wine that I'm going right. to drink, you know. But Daniel had a different perspective when, he, uh, when this began to take place, as we read in verse 8. But Daniel, the Bible said, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Well, I'm going to tell you, the spirit of our age seeks to turn people away from God and away from truth, just like it did in Daniel's life. Right. This was just the plan to try to turn them away and, and have them re become... Uh, worshipers of their idols. So uh, just like it was in the days of Daniel, so it is in our day. Babylon is still seeking to take captive the best and the brightest of our generation. The apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth of the ongoing spiritual battle uh, between the force of good and evil. When he wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 4 and 3, he said, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Satan, he is the God of this world, and that's with a little G-O-D, you understand. And he seeks to deceive and to, to blind people so that they can't come or won't come to the knowledge of the truth. And, you know, his weapons are still the same. He hadn't changed his tactics. His no. tactics are still called deceit and lies. Because right, right. Right. he told Eve, he said, Oh, thou shalt not surely die. But God said what? In the day you partake of, thou shalt surely die. So so the enemy's still doing the same thing. He tries to deceive, he, and he lies. And, and his plan is to inoculate the youth and the elders against the saving truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Satan seeks to indoctrine the youth of every generation with the values of Babylon from which they will serve their own lustful ambitions and desires. And folks, we're living in that today. That kind of situation is in our rampant in our world today. Right. Whew. 
But here's the beautiful part. We have mighty weapons to fight against the attacks of the enemy. God didn't leave us defenseless, folks. We're not, we're not left without any hope. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what are they? Mighty through God. To what? To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, the antidote for deception is to put on the whole armor of God so that we can protect not only our head, but our hearts. Amen. Folks, we got, we, got to, we got to get equipped. Right. We're in a battle. Right. And, and if, if, you're, if you're going to fight, you've got to have some weapons. Right. You can't have carnal weapons. No. Because the apostle went on to say in Ephesians 6 and 10, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's not, it's not my strength. It's not my physical strength, nor your physical strength. Not even your, your ability or your knowledge. But it all comes from God. He said, be strong in the Lord. Our, our strength has got to come from God. Amen. It's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. If you're going to have power, it's going to be through the spirit of the living God. Am I saying anything that makes sense to anybody today? This is where our strength comes from. And then Paul went on in verse 11 and said, put on the whole armor of God. You know, uh, the, the whole armor is what, what we've got to have, not just part of it. Uh, he said that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The enemy's out to kill, steal, and destroy. And the only way we're going to overcome him is by putting on that whole armor. What is it? Uh, he went on to say, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he went on to say, wherefore, take unto you, again, the whole armor. He, he, he specifically says the whole armor of God, right. that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. And then he begins to talk about that, that, that uh, armor, having your loins Gird about with truth. Folks, we've got we've to have God's word, amen, as, as, as that, that girdle that, uh, that, that holds our faith together. Truth is what holds us together. The enemy attacks truth. But I'm going to tell you, truth will stand, amen, the test of time. The enemy said to Jesus after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that they may, may be made bread. Jesus could have made them bread. He could have spoken. That stone would have turned into bread immediately. But he would have been yielding to the enemy. And that's what we have to not do. We can't afford to yield to the suggestions that the devil wants us to do. But Jesus said, Satan... It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but how? By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Folks, we've got to be built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. If we're built on anything else, we're not going to stand. And so that our loins go about with truth. You gotta love truth. You gotta have more than just you just you gotta have more than have it. You gotta love truth. You gotta love it. And when you love something, you cherish it. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Yes, it is right. And then he said, having on the breastplate of righteousness. That's where that, that protection from the heart. Amen. Having on that breastplate of righteousness. Living according to that word of God, that truth. And that guards us and protects us from the adversary when we've got that breastplate of righteousness on. Uh, you know, uh, and your feet shod, how? With the preparation of the gospel of peace. Folks, we've got to have, again, uh, we got to walk in truth. We've got to walk in the word of God. You know, uh, I'm just going to tell you, God's people are to be separated from the world. Amen. Our talk should be different. Right. Our attitude should be different. Right. And our actions should be different. Amen. Why? Because we say we are Christian. We say we are Christ-like. And if we say we are Christ-like and we don't do like Christ, then we're lying. Amen. And, you're bringing, and, and I'm bringing a reproach on the Lord if I do that. If I claim to be a Christian and I act just like everybody else acts and I, I throw fits and I get mad and, 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 and act, act ugly to people, 
Mm, okay, I know. I, I, that's, that's getting a little too touchy. But I'm just saying, we are, we are to manifest the love of God. And the love of God will, will, will be manifested when we show forth the, the right spirit, the right attitude, the right, the right words. And then he said, above all, more than any of all this, he said, taking the shield of faith. And a shield is something that's movable. When the enemy is firing his darts, you can move that shield. And what is it to do? It to protect you. It will protect you from all of those fiery darts. And don't you know that it, I just dropped my Bible. Don't you know the enemy is throwing fiery darts at every one of us that claim to be a child of God? That's his business. That's his purpose. That's his plan. But Jesus said, my plan is I'll protect you. You put it on, I'll protect you. I can't put your armor on you, Brother, Brother Russian. You can't put my armor, but I can. I can. A police officer, he, he's, got, he's got some protection. It's called a, a bulletproof vest. Hallelujah. Thank God. And uh, I, I think they need every kind of protection they can get. Right. And, and so they put it on. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, police department provides it, but if they don't put it on, they go out on the job, somebody shoots at them right toward their heart. If they'd have had their protection on, they would have not suffered whatever that bullet did to them. And that's the same way with us. When we put on that whole armor of God, we, we get protected. When the enemy's throwing those darts at us, we got something to shield ourselves and protect us. And the enemy can't penetrate, amen, that shield of faith. Well, maybe I'm just singing to the choir today. You're doing a good job. And then the Bible said, and take the helmet of salvation. Folks, you got to know that you know that you know Amen. that you got everything right between you and Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the old enemy, he lies, okay? Yes, he does. Who do you think you are? That's what he tells us. Who do you think you are? Do you think you're a Christian? Do you think you're going somewhere? Do you think, you think you're getting anywhere when you go to pray? You say, well, why are you saying all that, Sister Crazy? Been there, done that. Right. Who do you think you are? The old enemy tells me sometimes. You're nothing. Well, that part's right. I am nothing. But I serve a mighty God. Amen. I said, I serve a mighty God. And whatever I have, it's because of him. That's right. On my own, I'm nothing. But Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's where my strength is. It's in Jesus Christ. And so he says, take that helmet of salvation. You better put it on. And don't let the devil ever tell you you're not anything. And you're not, you're not going to. You tell the devil, you just, you just get back behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. Because that's where he belongs. He don't belong sitting on our shoulder talking us all that junk. He belongs behind us or under our feet. Get thee behind me, Satan. Hallelujah. And the sword of the Spirit. I'm going to get my sword now. Lord, have mercy. It's like my purse. I got everything in it. A, a woman's purse could be a good weapon because we put everything down in those things, you know. And in my Bible, I got all kinds of notes in here. You wouldn't believe it. But this is, this is the sword of the Spirit. It's called the Word of God. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joint and the marrow and is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. What is the word of God? This is our, this is our offensive weapon. This is what we use against the adversary when he comes at us. Satan, it is written. The word of God says, submit ye therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's the book, amen? That's, that's this weapon at, at, at work in our life, amen? And, and, and again, the enemy does not belong here. He belongs under our feet. So, so Daniel purposed to remain separate and holy. Uh, he made a request, and his request was this in verse 8. He said, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And, and that phrase, Daniel purposed in his heart. That's some powerful words. You know, I, I've, I've heard of a made-up mind all my 
spiritual life, so to speak. But today we're talking about a made-up heart. Right. You know, a made-up heart. Made heart. You know, uh, we, we don't read where Daniel showed any kind of bad attitude toward those men that said, the king said, you've got to eat this. But we do read where he did exhibit a heart that was determined, and that's the key word, determined to stay set upon his God. You see, the key to Daniel's victory regarding their diet was that he had his heart set on staying pure and holy before the Lord. You know, before they ever got to Babylon, I believe Daniel already had figured out there was going to be some things that he was going to have to refuse. That's right. And folks, we're met with things on a daily basis that sometimes we know we're going to have to refuse some things. That's right. The enemy's going to tempt us. He's going to set things before us, amen, to try to get our, uh, get, you know, make it look good. That, that's the thing. The pride of the eye, yep. the pride of life, yep. the lust of the flesh, you know. Yep. The enemy makes things look good. And probably to the eye, what, what was set before them probably looked like a real, real, real meal. I mean, you know. Who doesn't like turkey and dressing? Who doesn't like ham and, and sweet potatoes? And, you know, who doesn't, you know, who doesn't like filet mignon? And, I mean, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. But, but here, uh, Daniel already, already had, a, had that made up heart that, that he was going to stay pure before God and holy. And he was going to refuse to eat the king's meat or drink the king's wine. And, and you see, his values in his heart lined up with his decision to abstain from the appearance of evil. You know, if, 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 if we're wishy-washy, yeah. you know, trying to sit on the, on the fence, you know, this way today and that way tomorrow, uh, that's not a made-up heart. A made-up heart says, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to serve God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it doesn't matter, Satan, what you've got to offer me, I'm going to live for the Lord. And, and, and so Daniel already had it, had it purpose in his heart. He was already devoted to his God. And that commitment is what helped him to stay true to what he knew was right. That's right. And, and he was able to stand up for what was right and not give in to pressure. You know, it's easier to resist temptation if you've already thought through your convictions well before the temptation arrives. Right. That's it. I'm just saying, if you know there's things that you have a problem with, First thing of all, you need to stay away from those places right. or those people Amen. or those things. Right. If you know that's a weakness, stay away. stay away. I mean, don't put yourself in harm's way. Amen. If somebody's out there shooting, I'm not going to run out there and say, what y'all doing? Well, that'd be crazy. I know what they're doing. They're shooting. I'm staying in here. Hopefully there's a little protection in here, you know. You know, uh, you, know you don't just run out, you know, and, and you prepare yourself. So uh, Daniel and his friends had already made the decision uh, to be faithful to the laws of God before they were faced with the king's, uh, what would you call them, delicacies? You know, oh, you know, when you, when you make up in your mind, you're not going to eat no more donuts. <laughs> And no more birthday cake. No more ice cream. Man, it just seems like everybody wants to give you some food that's that kind of stuff. And you say, well, just let me smell of it. <laughs> that's all I say. Just let me smell of it. <laughs> uh, okay, that's enough of that. Um, that's almost yielded to the temptation, is it? But, but that, they already had their mind made up. The decision was already, it was there. They, they were going to stay faithful to their God. And uh, they didn't hesitate to stick with their conviction. It, it, it was settled. It was settleable. I believe, here's how I believe. You can believe how you want to. I believe it was settled before they ever left the land of Judah. We're going to a foreign land. We're going, to be, we're going to go down there and they're going to try to do all kinds of things to take us away from serving our God. But we're going to live for God. You know, they had already had a made up mind because look at here. Look at here. Um, they were in the land of Judah where people were supposed to be serving God. And they had turned to idolatry and turned away from God. But they were already, they were already faithful to God even in their homeland. That's right. I'll be that'll preach. I might want to preach that sometime. Uh, 
But I mean, if, if you've already got it in here, it's no problem when you get out there, when you when you met head on because you're co totally convinced. Um, First Thessalonians 5.22 said, abstain, that means stay away from all appearance of evil. That's kind of what I said a while ago. If, if, you know, if it's evil and you know it, it could be a temptation, don't go there. So Daniel, he respectfully made his request, and he had found favor already with the prince of the eunuchs. Have you ever noticed, like, for instance, when Joseph, he was put in prison, but even in, uh, well, well, he was, first of all, he's, he was sold, and, and he went to Potiphar's house. But you know, when he got to Potiphar's, Potiphar's house, you know, he had favor with Potiphar, did he not? And then when Mrs. Potiphar came after him with, you know, whatever, temptation, and he ran, and, and she convinced her husband that, you know, that he had forced himself upon her, uh, he was put in prison. But you know, when he got put in prison, you know what? God gave him favor in prison. All I'm saying is, when you stand for God, God's going to give you favor. Thank you. Okay. Maybe I'm just too whatever. Maybe I'm too too whatever. Maybe I'm just way out there, and y'all thought, poor old lady. <laughs> poor old sister, please. But I, I just believe that. I believe that. Uh, Daniel 1 and 9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. You know, it, it could have been Daniel's respectful attitude. I'm just going to tell you, a right attitude will get you a long way. That's right. Amen. Amen. Those of you that are in authority, you know that. If somebody is respectful to you, then you'll show them due respect. Somebody comes at you with being disrespectful, those of you in authority, you know, you might would have not given them that ticket if they hadn't had such a bad attitude about it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I said a while ago, a soft answer turneth away wrath. You get an attitude with that officer, all he's doing is his job. You're the one that was in the fault. Yeah. Okay. Uh, authority. Okay. Uh, but his attitude, it got, it got him somewhere is what I'm saying. Uh, our attitude goes a long, long way. It could have been... All in God's plan, and it was, that they received special privilege, and they did. Whatever the reason, it came as a blessing to those young men. However, uh, the prince of the eunuchs feared the king and what he would, what, what he would do when he looked at... Here's, here's Daniel. He's asking, uh, he, he's asking for something that that's, uh, gets what the king commanded. That, that's the first thing that, that, that this, guy's, this prince of the eunuchs is looking at. And then he's thinking, okay, if I do this, and then those guys look real pale and, you know, like they can't hardly get one foot in front of the other, but I'm going to be in trouble. If they, they want to do this for three years. But, but, but here we go, verse 10. And the prince of the eunuch said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. So Daniel wasn't afraid of the outcome because he knew. He knew that his God right. would help them Amen. when they put God first. But seek ye first, Matthew 6, 33, I believe, says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When you put God first in your life, you don't have to worry about coming in last. God's going to give you favor. And so Daniel wasn't afraid of the outcome. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mich Michel, and Azariah, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. And let them give us pulse to eat. Now, folks, if I if I looked it up right, that word pulse is none other than what we would call like beans and peas and lentils. Okay, that's what that word pulse to eat. Man, give me a pot of white beans or green or brown bean. I, I like those kind of. Uh, if that's called pulse, I like that. But I gotta have some cornbread. I don't know if they could have cornbread, but I gotta have some cornbread with my. Uh, so give us pulse to eat and, and, and water to drink. They didn't want that king's wine. Uh, then, then let our countenance be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat as thou seest, deal with thy servants. In other words, whatever the outcome is, then you can deal with us. So here's the thing. Separation and holiness does not just happen, folks. Uh, they come 
by way of making a choice. Right. Uh, personal choice and decisions are always uh, the important element when you're pursuing holiness with the Lord. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all, everybody say all, all, all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, doing what? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is what we are to do. We are to cleanse ourselves. So it's a personal effort it, that's required in order to, to achieve both inward and outward holiness. And it's true uh, that the Holy Spirit is the only source of true holiness and that we as humans are, we're not able to produce that holiness from our own human efforts. It takes the spirit of the living God Amen. inside of us. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Jesus on the inside, working on us. Amen. Uh, but we have to cooperate. We have to cooperate with God's spirit by following the, his guidance and, and by making those vital choices. Folks, believers have to mentally decide with our head to follow the leading of the spirit that's with our heart and bringing our heart and our head into a decisive action to pursue the holiness of God and that's called perfecting holiness in the fear of God that's what it's all about so after 10 days you know the story Daniel and his his three companions the bible said in verse 15 at the end of their of 10 days their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all, all, there's that word all again, all. all the others who had eaten the king's meat. I just got to say it. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God, what a mighty God we serve. God blessed Daniel and his friends because of their commitment. Folks, now the rest of the story, this ain't the end of Daniel and these three boys' commitment. Y'all know the rest of that story, but we're not in that lesson today. But here's the thing, folks, when, when we, when we uh, allow God to work in our life and we allow him and we give him preeminence in our life, he's going to work things out for our good. That's right. God didn't bring us this far on our journey to let us, let us down now. He brought us to where we're at to bring us through to the other side. Right. He brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He didn't bring them to the Red Sea to let them be drowned or let them be die, uh, die by, uh, by uh, right. Pharaoh's army. He took them through the water. And folks, he'll bring you through your situation. You just got to stay faithful to God. Don't let the enemy sell you a bill of, of junk, but you stay faithful to God. You put God first in your life and honor God. Separation has two aspects, and I know I got to get out of here. And those two aspects of, of holiness is separation from worldliness and being separated unto God. And I don't have time to read all these scriptures. I've got more scriptures. But I'm going to tell you, the, the word separate is defined as to set off by boundaries, to mark off from others by boundaries. Uh, the word of God says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Almighty. So folks, as believers, we have been called to a life of holiness reason we're called, the Bible said in 1 Peter 1 15 and 1 16 but has he which hath called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for I am holy. So the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12 and 14 follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So the life of separation and holiness to which a believer has been called is a lifestyle, folks, that glorifies God and glorifies God's work Thank of you, sanctification within the believer. Thank I'm just going to tell you, when you've been filled with his spirit, you have been sanctified. I'm telling you, and that sanctification is noticeable. People know, amen, a child of God. I've had people say, are you sanctified? I say, oh, yes, I am. I've been filled with his spirit. Amen. So, uh, uh the Apostle Paul uh, says in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections yeah, on things above and not on things 
on this earth. Folks, when we got a made up heart, yeah. our, our heart uh, is going to be set toward the things of God and what pleases the Lord. So Daniel didn't just have a made up mind to serve the Lord. Daniel had a made up heart. And Daniel's decision wasn't just something that he came up with in his mind, but it was born out of a heart of love, a heart of conviction, and a heart of commitment. Daniel purposed, yes. it was in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat, and it was in his heart that he wanted to honor God. And when we honor God, God's going to exalt uh, those, and exalt him, God's going God's to reward us uh, when we put our faith and trust in him. Look what was the outcome in verse 17 of Daniel 1. As for these four children, God gave them. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the, uh, at the end of the days that the king had said he would bring them in, after three years, that's what it was, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. Three years of eating like they asked to eat. And the king communed with them. And among all that was found, there's that word all again, I, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them. How did he find them? In verse 20. Ten times better than wow. all the yeah. magicians yeah. and astrologers that were in all his realm. Ten days they wanted to be tested and tried, and they came out. Ten times better than all of those that ate the king's meat. Amen. Amen. All I'm saying is when we get it down inside of our heart, God's going to honor what we do for him, no matter what the situation, if we'll just be obedient with a made-up heart to serve God with everything you got, God will honor and bless that, that, that effort. God Amen. bless you. Praise the Lord.